When I was at university and studying English and European history, I came across a very big question which had also been there in my school history. And this was the origins of capitalism. Now, capitalism in some ways is universal and has always been with us. Capitalism with a small c, that is the desire to profit, to truck and to barter, as Adam Smith put it. And Max Weber had realized that ancient civilizations and oriental civilizations, everyone wants to make a profit. So capitalism is universal, the desire to exchange and make something on the exchange. But Weber and others correctly pointed out that this kind of capitalism was overtaken and replaced in some parts of the world by something special, which is capitalism with a capital C. And that is a system of market capitalism. That is the what Polanyi calls the disembedding of the economy. That is that individuals can go out, make money, keep it for themselves, private property, banks, markets, a system which isn't found universally and indeed is often thought to be very recent. Of course, much of our world is now capitalist and there are very few places which aren't. But as Marx and Weber and others pointed out, it is an unusual system and it seems to have grown very rapidly and quite recently. Now, why did it grow and where did it grow and how did it grow? My view is that, as Weber and Marx both thought, the origins of modern capitalism are in England. They thought it emerged sometime in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries in a great revolution or transformation from one kind of peasant embedded non-capitalist society into what we know now around us. But when I came to study this question, um, I began to find through a detailed study of English historical documents that there didn't seem to be any massive transformation in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. The legal system was tinkered with but not fundamentally altered. Likewise, the political system, the religious system, the social system. I couldn't see in the villages and documents that I was studying any great revolutionary change. And so I was increasingly puzzled. And it's here that a method that I found later described very well in detective fiction, which I'm going to be talking about in each of these talks, comes to be applicable. This is the method of the invisibility of the two obvious things that are all around you and absolutely in front of you become more or less invisible. The famous story which described this by Edgar Allan Poe, the purloined letter describing his detective Dupin, concerns a man who stole a very valuable important secret letter and he knew the police would look for it in his home. So thinking of where to hide it because they would look everywhere in the end, he decided to hide it in the letter rack, on the desk, in the middle of his study. And of course, the police looked everywhere, but they didn't look in the obvious, too obvious place. So this is the method of the over-obvious. And it's one which uh, Sherlock Holmes took from Dupin. And here's how Holmes describes it. Um, or rather, this is how Dupin describes it. 
When first consulted on the letter, Dupin engages in banter with the detective. Perhaps it is the very simplicity of the thing which puts you at fault, said my friend. What nonsense you do talk, re replied the prefect, laughing heartily. Perhaps the mystery is a little too plain, said Dupin. Oh, good heavens, who ever heard of such an idea? Dupin later explains what tends to happen to obvious things. Quote, These, like the over-largely lettered signs and placards of the street, escape observation by dint of being excessively obvious. And here the physical oversight is precisely analogous with the moral inapprehension by which the intellect suffers to pass unnoticed those considerations which are too obtrusively and too palpably self-evident. So he further describes, coming down to the particular strategy of hiding the valuable letter, his uh, Poe writes, to conceal this letter, the minister had resorted to the comprehensive and sagacious expedient of not attempting to conceal it at all. So it was in the most obvious place and hence invisible. What is often now described in some ways as the elephant in the room, taking up the whole space but no one either notices it or perhaps talks about it. Now, in my book, the origins of English individualism. I approached this subject by tracing back a very obvious feature, central feature of the English legal system. And this was the system of inheritance. The way you pass your wealth from one generation to another determines everything and is also symbolic and significant indication of how the society works. And when I came to look in detail at how this worked through the centuries and went back to the 15th, 14th, 13th, 12th century, I discovered that the English had a very unusual, nowhere else in the world had it, inheritance system whereby parents could if they wished, leave their property to anyone. In all other civilizations, parents and children own joint property. Therefore, the question or the possibility of leaving it to someone else is not there. It isn't the parents to leave it. The children have worked with their parents on their estate and so on. And so when the parents die, the children get the property and perhaps probably divide it among themselves. But in the English case, from Anglo-Saxon times onwards, you could make a will, you could write a document saying, I want my property to go to someone else, to the church or to a friend or to a dog's home nowadays. So basically, property was held by an individual, one parent, a mother, a father, and none of the children could bank on or assume or depend on ever getting that property. If they later in their lives alienated their parents, their parents could cut them off, leave the money, the estates elsewhere. There were a few very rich estates which were entailed and had to go to through a certain line, but for the majority of the population, your money was your own and your children had to fend for themselves. This system, which is captured in a small Latin phrase, which is from a medieval law book, Nemo est heres viventis, no one is the heir of a living man. That means that while a person is living, no one is their automatic heir. And this is different from what happened in France, in Italy, in many countries in Europe and also in all the great peasant civilizations. What in effect it did was to split the family from the economy 
and create the conditions whereby individuals could make their own money and then leave their own money to whom they liked. And this separation from, of the society and the economy, as Max Weber realized, is the basis of capitalism. It's what makes us disembedded and capitalist. And yet it is a feature of English law going back a thousand years. Very unusual, but very, very powerful. And so obvious, because of course now everyone knows that they can leave their property to who they like. They don't have to leave it to their children if they don't want to. This system is so obvious, so much around us, that like the purloin letter, it has become impossible. But once I'd seen it, I realized that our capitalist system is very ancient and very important in English and hence American and now world civilization. Thank you.